Thank you. It is now time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Acting Premier. Acting Premier, Ontario was once a thriving location for investment, attracting companies from across the globe and driving our economy. Specifically, uh, Ontario was proud to be a world leader in the mining industry. Just over a decade ago, under the previous government, we were the top mining jurisdiction in the world, number one. Now we're number 28. Wow. Every year, my colleagues and I meet with the Ontario Mining Association, wow. and every year they have the same issues with your government. Ontario mining companies are faced with some of the highest energy costs in North America, the highest worker safety premiums in Canada, a massive infrastructure deficit, and tax instability. So, Minister, what are you doing to address the high energy rates that are making it difficult, very difficult, for mining companies to continue to invest in Ontario? Well, Speaker, it's, um, it's unfortunate that the opposition party continues to run down Ontario's economy. In fact, Speaker, we've made some important progress in our recovery from the recession, the global recession. Stop the clock. The, um, the comments today prod me to say that I will uh, interject on those that interject while the answer is being given on that side, and I will uh, ensure that we, we get this done quickly and effectively with your cooperation. Finish, please. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I know that the minister is going to want to respond specifically from to Renfrew, money, come to order. I know the opposition will want to celebrate, in fact, the progress that we've made. We've gone from a, a, a all-time high unemployment rate of 9.4 percent down to 7.1, still too high, but moving in the right direction. We've added 723,000 more jobs, Speaker, and last year employment in Ontario uh, increased by 100,000. We're moving in the right direction. The opposition party Answer. should stop running down Ontario and celebrate our progress, Speaker. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I say to the honourable member, it's hard to believe anybody could run the province further into the ground than what your government's exactly. already done. 93rd consecutive month in a row that this province that used to be the economic engine of Canada has an unemployment rate above the national average. Shame, Shame. on you. Shame. Dead last in Canada for jobs. You know what? Um, talking about the mining industry again, Dalton McGinney told us he was going to fix the mining industry with the uh, uh, work around the Ring of Fire. Uh, he quote, he was going to garner billions of dollars of new investments and thousands of new jobs. We know nothing's happening around the Ring of Fire. The mining industry itself tells us you've set up a shell economic corporation that doesn't do anything. There's not even anyone there to really talk about the needs of the industry. In fact, uh, the Globe Mail article recently talking about the Ring of Fire, Cliff's uh, chief executive, uh, Lorenko Gonclaves, said, quote, I don't believe under my watch, Question. and I plan to stay for the next 60 years, that the Ring of Fire will be developed. So once again, Minister, I didn't get an answer. What are you doing to bring down these industrial hydro Thank rates you. that are driving jobs out of this province, yeah, yeah. particularly you. the mining sector? Minister of Northern Development of Mines. Minister well, of Northern thank Development Thank you, Mr. Mines. Speaker. Speaking specifically about energy rates, we certainly recognize what a, a, a cost that is to the industry, and that's why we put in place a Northern Industrial Energy Rate Program, which is bringing costs down for major mining companies by 25 percent, as well as other, other incentive programs under the Minister of Energy, which have made a real difference, and that's what the Ontario Mining Association told us when we met with them the other day, that they are very pleased with that, and they want to see that continue. In in terms of the uh, comments made by the CEO of Cliffs, I think what's really important, and, and the, the leader should note this, is the, is the way that his comments were responded to by everybody in the industry, which was indeed there is significant interest in the Ring of Fire. There are a number of companies that are interested in moving forward with that, and those comments were put out very publicly yesterday by those who responded to the, the CEO's comments. So we are going to continue to, to move forward in a very positive way, making sure that we make progress related to the building of the Development Corp. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, that's uh, that's a, a point that the minister raises, and that is, uh, are you going to continue the Northern Industrial Rate Program? It's a shame that you've got rates, hydro rates, so high in the province, and now you have to bring in a subsidy program. I suspect for this winter you're going to have to bring one in for seniors. Uh, continue uh, to expand the one for seniors and low-income Ontario families. Uh, we're already hearing stories uh, phoning into our uh, riding offices about families being cut off because they can't afford their hydro rates, and the winter is just beginning. Uh, I say to the member across the way. And the second, uh, so there's a rumor about you discontinuing the uh, the industrial. 
uh, hydro subsidy. And the other rumour that the mining industry is definitely worried about is you'll do the same thing you did to De Beers when you suddenly brought in the unexpected uh, diamond tax, that you're going to uh, increase tax. the uh, mining profits tax. So I want to know Fortune. specifically, are you, increasing, are you going to keep the subsidy on hydro for them so they at least can continue here in the province for a bit? And uh, what are you doing about the money? Thank tax? you. So. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, I mean, I think it's really um, pretty irresponsible for the comments made by the leader of the opposition, particularly as they did not support the introduction of the Northern Industrial Energy Rate Program. They voted against it. We've supported this in a strong fashion. It's been extended to the year 2016, and there is a very clear commitment on our part to maintain that rate. We recognize how important that is. There's no question. When we met with the Mining Association a couple of days ago, they were talking positive. They were talking about the value and economic impact of what a new gold mine can bring to the economy. That was fantastic. We had another report that made it very, very clear about the huge benefit of the mining supply and services sector, being about $10 billion in terms Member of the from from The Kamora. fact is we've got new mines opening. We've got 10 new mines that opened in the last 10 years. The fact is the industry is, is certainly under great challenges, but we are working with them closely and will continue yes, to support sir. them as we will in the ring of fire. Here, here. Here's your the Leader of the Opposition. Yeah, back to the Acting uh, Premier, Mr. Speaker. Uh, on Friday afternoon of the August long weekend, uh, your government decided it was a convenient time to release a report detailing the waste and mismanagement of government pensions in the energy sector. The report, conducted by pension expert Jim Leach, revealed that Ontario taxpayers are contributing $5 for every $1 that employees contribute. In fact, it's worse, at Hydro One, employees only contributed or contribute 12 cents of every dollar in their pension. Good deal. Minister, we all know these pensions are far from sustainable, and despite your constant promises, you've actually done nothing to fix them. And now hydro rates are going up once again on November 1st, yep. just a couple of days. Minister, how much more are hydro rates going to increase because of your inability yes, to manage pensions properly at OPG and Hydro One? Good question. Thank you. Deputy Premier. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Finance. Mr. Speaker. Interesting question, given the fact that uh, we commissioned Jim Leach to take a review, look at uh, what is occurring, that it's been occurring over many years, Mr. Speaker, and we have taken an initiative recognizing how important it is to protect taxpayers' money because, after all, we are part of this initiative. And Jim Leach has been, uh, and I commend him on the work that he's done, that he's brought forward, and uh, the question comes as a result of the efforts that we're taking, Mr. Speaker, not because of any design that they've made. In fact, we're trying to correct some of the things that they put in place in the first place. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Premier, Mr. Speaker, let me read a few quotes from that report that describe the situation your government's got us into. The report said that pensions are generous, expensive, and inflexible. It also stated, should plans go further into deficit, the sponsors and ultimately ratepayers will, re will be required to pay even larger contributions. Now, Minister, your government did recognize this problem as far back as, or as two years ago in 2012 when you committed in that budget to reform these ludicrous pensions, but you've done nothing since except reiterate that promise two more times. So it's clear you, don't, you uh, won't act or you don't want to act, or you don't have the stomach to act to uh, get these skyrocketing hydro rates under control. Um, do you really think it's fair that these people, uh, public service uh, employees in the energy sector, Question. have these hugely fat, hugely fat pensions, and yet people uh, at the other end of the spectrum in Ontario are having the lights Thank shut you. off because they can't pay their bills? Mr. Finance. Mr. Speaker. The question occurs only because we are taking action. Right. The question only is being made today because they've never had the stomach or the gumption to make corrections to the mistakes that they made in the past. We are moving forward. We've done the review. Jim Leach has consulted with Hydro One, OPG, ISO, from and ESA. We recognize that the pensions that have been negotiated over a long period of time need to be corrected. We've taken steps already with other pension holders to the tune of saving Ontario $2 billion every year, and we'll continue to do that in this case as well. We have an opportunity to save ratepayers a total of $1 billion by 2016, not because of what they're saying, Mr. Speaker, Answer. but because what we are doing. Thank you. Thank you. Final supplementary. Minister, you had Jim Leach's report before the election. You sat on it. You didn't let anybody know that you had it. 
You didn't let Mr. Leach speak about his recommendations. And then when it finally was put out on a long weekend in August, on a Friday, uh, you said you would review the port report. You, uh, you have said since 2012 that you would do something about this. Meanwhile, you continue to sign collective agreements in the energy sector that perpetuate these bloated pensions, these bloated, uh, uh, unjustified uh, payouts uh, to people that uh, probably uh, go home at 5 o'clock every night, if not 4.30. The fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, uh, he mentioned the Electrical Safety Authority. Well, in May of this year, you signed a collective agreement with them that not only perpetuated their bloated pensions, but you gave them a 2.7% pay increase. Uh, 300,000 Ontarians uh, are out of work in the manufacturing sector. Guess what? Uh, I say to them, Mr. Speaker, guess what? They've had 100% pay cut. Thank you. Why do you keep going with these pensions and, inclu and increasing hydro rates in this province? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, <laughs> we have had over 700,000 net new jobs since 2003. We have over 100,000 jobs that were created last year. They suggest that we cut 100,000 jobs in their platform. As we review Jim Leach's report, we continue to pursue efficiencies in OPG and Hydro One through ongoing business transformation initiatives. In fact, Ed Clark is looking at it as well, something that they deny as being appropriate. And over the last three years, efficiency savings of approximately $500 million have been achieved in both agencies. OPG launched a company-wide business transformation initiative to enhance efficiencies further and reduce spending. And to date, OPG's business transformation plan has resulted in savings of $275 million in 2011. As noted, Answer. the work that we're doing is going to save over a billion dollars by 2016 with pensions, and Hydro One has identified over $500 million in cost savings and productivity improvements in 2013-15 alone. We're doing the job, Mr. Speaker, and we'll continue to do so. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Acting Premier. Like Elvis, the Liberal credibility on openness and transparency has left the building. <laughs> they, they insist that this time it will be different. This time you're going to be progressive, and this time they're going to be transparent. So can Order. the minister explain why this time they are protecting Liberal insiders, introducing a half-baked CEO salary cap, privatizing by stealth, and selling off public assets? Thank you. Stephanie Freeman. Well, Speaker, I'm not exactly sure what the question was, but let me give the answer that I think uh, she was asking, and that's on our executive compensation bill, Speaker. I think it's very important. I think the people of this province uh, have the right to know why people are paid what they're paid, if, they, if they're paid for by taxpayers. That's why we've introduced legislation, Speaker, yesterday, and we announced we're actually going to uh, introduce an amendment at, uh, at committee that will expand the reach of this bill. People deserve to know why publicly paid people are getting paid what they are. So we're bringing in a process that will get, uh, gather the information and then set out thoughtful, reasonable caps, bans upon uh, which compensation will be paid. Speaker, it's a, a much more thoughtful response than that offered by the NDP. Thank you. Supplement. The Deputy Minister should uh, read her own legislation. There is no cap in that bill. Speaker, we know that the Liberals are planning to sell down their interest in Hydro One and to bring private companies into our local hydro utilities. And we know that this Liberal government is wasting Ontarians' money on the outsourcing of IT services. We found $200 million. Help me help you. Why would we, why we do that? And I would call that privatization. And, and it's a stealth agenda that you have. What does the minister call it? Thank you. Well, you uh, speaker, this question is coming from the person who actually lobbied for the job of being the cut czar if, if in fact, the NDP were to form government. This is the person who said, choose me, choose me, I can find $600 million of savings primarily in health care and education. 
Well, this is one of the first opportunities to offer constructive advice on how we actually drive savings to suggest that we could save $200 million in IT by taking on her advice is baloney, Speaker. I don't know if that's parliamentary. If it's not, I apologize. But it just simply doesn't add up. She's got her facts wrong. She refuses to correct her facts. Yes, sir. And, Speaker, we are committed to getting best value, and we would welcome the helpful advice from the party opposite. Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, for 10 years, the Liberals have been saying they'll deal with out-of-control public sector CEO compensation. And, uh, and for 10 years, public sector CEO compensation has shot through the roof. Now the minister is saying that they will have a salary cap, but they just won't say what that cap will be. And they apparently scribbled that legislation on the back of a napkin because somehow they forgot to include agencies like eHealth and like Mars. How can the minister expect anyone in this province to take anything that she says seriously? Well, once again, I have to correct the facts, Speaker. Yes, it is true that we have rejected the NDP position that there be a cap across all, all executives, no matter what the job is that they do. That is not a particularly thoughtful approach to what I, uh, we all agree is a, an issue that we have to address. So we will be creating hard caps. They will be different in different sectors, as well they should be. We will be looking at public sector comparators. We will be looking across Canada and beyond to actually justify the bans, including a hard cap, uh, by sector speaker. So it's a thoughtful approach to a complex problem, but we are determined to take it on. I am very pleased that the member opposite is suggesting that they do support Answer. they will support the amendment to expand the reach of the bill. Thank you. A new question, the member from Kitchener Waterloo. Speaker, again to the acting premier. The minister was given strict instruct instructions in her mandate letter to increase transparency and accountability. But instead of ensuring Ontarians hear testimony from the people accused of wiping computers in the premier's office, like Peter Feist and Laura Miller, the government is protecting Liberal insiders. Can the minister tell this House if her mandate letter is worth the paper that it's printed on? Thank you very much, Speaker, and I thank uh, the member opposite uh, for the question. Um, I think, I think uh, the member opposite will agree by looking at uh, the actions of our government uh, by the mandate letter she suggested herself, by the legislation she was referring to earlier on in her first part of the question, dealing with government accountability and transparency that we, under the leadership of our Premier, are taking very concrete steps to ensure that government is open, that government is transparent, that information is readily available uh, to uh, uh, Ontarians. Uh, Speaker, that is the commitment that we made to the people of Ontario in the, in, in the, in the last election. That's the commitment that is very clearly outlined in the speech from the throne, and Speaker, we will carry through that commitment as well. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Again, to uh, the acting uh, premier, uh, the minister received a mandate letter that said, "Make government transparent." But instead, she's protecting Liberal insiders from testifying at the committee. Her mandate letter talks about protecting public services, but the Liberals are privatizing public services like IT and hydro utilities. And it talks about getting CEO pay under control. But the Liberals are introducing the first pay cap with no cap, and they're making last-minute changes after they got caught leaving organizations like eHealth and Mars out of the legislation. The minister doesn't seem to take her mandate letter seriously. Why should anyone else? President of the Treasury Board, Speaker. President of the Treasury Board. Thank you, Speaker. And, uh, the Premier uh, has made it very clear she wants Ontario to be the most open and transparent province in the country. And, Speaker, that is what we're doing. And even the member opposite is referencing the mandate letters. Speaker, for the first time in our history, our mandate letters have been released publicly. The member opposite is referring to the mandate letters, as are other people across the province who actually are paying attention to what happens uh, in the Ontario government. 
So I think uh, by releasing the mandate letters, we have signaled very clearly that we are committed to openness and transparency. When it comes to executive compensation, just to remind uh, anyone watching, our initial uh, legislation covers hospitals, hydro entities, school boards, universities, Answer. colleges, uh, CCAC speaker, and we're expanding to 64 more organizations. Uh, we will be introducing that amendment in committee. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, I, I guess I would just say that the actions speak louder than words printed on a mandate letter. The Liberals can tell themselves they're being progressive, but this is what people actually see. They see Liberals scrambling to protect their, uh, their friend, their Liberal friends, from giving answers about about the gas plants. They see a promise for a public sector CEO pay cap, but there's no actual cap in that legislation, and they're not even sure who it should apply to. And they see a government that's outsourcing, privatizing, and wasting money, but insisting it's being responsible this time. Things will be different. Does the minister think protecting insiders, skyrocketing CEO sal salaries, and an accelerated privatization agenda, which is hurting this province, is actually being progressive? Well, Speaker, I think we are doing exactly what the people of this province elected us to do, Speaker, and uh, we are committed to uh, to balance uh, to, to come to balance by 1718, and at the same time continue to strengthen public services and build the infrastructure that this province so sorely needs, Speaker. If the member opposite has a better idea on how we can build the necessary roads and bridges and transit systems that this province needs, I'd love to have her suggestion. All I'm hearing is you don't, you can't do it this way, you can't do it that way, you can't do it this way, and there are so far zero constructive ideas on how we raise the significant capital required to build the infrastructure and assets that the people of this province need. Thank you. Your question, the member from Dufferin Tallinn. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Minister, during the ice storm last January, many municipalities stepped up to assist stranded motorists who were unable to get home as a result of closed roads. In my own riding, Shelburne and Melanchthon applied for $51,000 and $50,000 each to the Disaster Relief Assistance Program, only to be denied because, to quote the rejection letter, these costs can be managed within municipal budgets. Minister, do you believe it is fair for Shelburne and Melanchthon to foot the total bill when they were sheltering stranded, stranded motorists from across Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Health. Uh, thanks, Mr. Speaker, and thanks for the question. What I think is fair is that municipalities, uh, for whatever reason or combination of reasons, suffer the most damage and have the least uh, ability to respond uh, fiscally to the challenge that that presents gets helped uh, as quickly as possible. And those that have the financial wherewithal to handle the, uh, the concerns uh, uh, will understand that those that are in, in greater need uh, uh, should get uh, the assistance that, uh, that they require. We can't respond to every request out there. The ice storm was a one-off uh, uh, issue as well. It wasn't like the normal ODRAP uh, uh, kind of uh, position. But uh, those municipalities that have uh, been most challenged and are least able to respond are the ones that are getting yes, assistance. Sir. Thank you. <clears throat> Supplementary. So my question to the minister is, how bad does it have to be? I understand you've approved $190 million in disaster relief funding, yet decided that Shelburne and Melanchthon don't qualify. To put this in perspective, the mayor-elect of Melanchthon stated that the costs of the damages would have a serious impact on creating its next budget for the township, and stressed that $50,000 is the equivalent of a 4% tax hike. Minister, will you reassess these requests from Shelburne and Melanchthon in light of the significant burden these costs will mean to their municipal budgets? Uh, Mr. Speaker, we have a process in place. Uh, before the ice storm, there was no funding allocated specifically to respond to ice storm issues. Uh, this government found a way to provide $190 million to those most stressed. Um, I think that should be celebrated, Mr. Speaker. I agree. Thank you. New question? From Bramley Gormal. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. The hundreds and thousands of Ontarians who work through temporary job agencies often work alongside co-workers earning 40% less pay, 
fewer or no benefits at all, job insecurity, and little protection against workplace abuses. Bill 18 gave this government an opportunity to fix these problems, but the government has failed once again. Instead, they've left many of the barriers that have trapped people in insecure work for years. The government could have taken the time to listen to temporary job agency workers and develop real solutions to address the problems, but instead they're rushing through a deeply flawed bill through a time allocation motion. Why is this government using strong-arm tactics, pushing through this bill, instead of protecting those vulnerable workers in our province? Thank you, Premier. Sir Labour. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the member for the for the question on uh, on Bill 18, which passed through the House yesterday. And I'm very pleased to say, with all party support, the intent of this bill builds on a 2009 bill, which prohibited agencies from imposing barriers that prevent cli uh, clients from hiring those assigned employees directly. They prohibit clients of agencies from any reprisal against assignment employees for asserting the rights they have under the Employment Standards Act. If this bill is passed, Speaker, and I hope it is, uh, it's going to ensure that temporary help agency recruits are not charged fees by those agencies for things like resumes, for simply taking a job, having the information they need, the seizure of passports, documents is included in this bill. I would urge the House and the member to support this bill. There's a process where people will be Sir. able to come forward, make recommendations along the way. I urge that we get to that point, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, a specific example of how flawed this bill is, is that, and how, little, how far it doesn't, it doesn't go far enough, is the fact that Bill 18 now only extends to joint and several liability to protect unpaid wages and unpaid overtime, but not public holidays and other basic employment standards. If the liability is not extended, the way it works right now is that direct employees, so that direct employees, direct employers and temporary job uh, agencies are responsible for all employment standards, then temporary workers are still left without protection. New Democrats will be moving a motion that will extend all responsibility to both the employer and the temporary job agency. Will the government support this motion to truly protect the workers in this province? Thank you, Minister Labour. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again for the supplementary question from the member. Obviously, we will all watch with interest as the process uh, unfolds, as it should. But what, let me tell you what this bill does do, Bill 18. It establishes joint and several liability between the agencies and the clients for the failure to pay wages. That means that those companies that would now potentially be liable, if the agencies refuse or won't pay the workers, the companies themselves have to pay the workers. That's, That's protection that these people don't have right now, Speaker, and it's good protection. It also helps if the temporary help, uh, if the uh, if the worker is injured. The injury could also affect the company's costs as well, which is an extra incentive to all companies in this province, those that employ temporary help agencies, to ensure that they've got a safe workplace. It's an added incentive. I know that that's an aim of all yes, members sir. of this House, that the people come home from work at the end of the day safe. This bill moves the yardsticks on this, and it's worth the support Thank of you. every member of this House. Wow. Your question? A member from Newmarket, Aurora. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister responsible for Senior Affairs. Minister, I think I speak for everyone when I say Ontario's seniors have significantly contributed to the success of our great province and that they continue to make meaningful and significant contributions. Mr. Speaker, October 1st is recognized in Canada as National Seniors Day and by the United Nations as the International Day of Older Persons. Mr. Speaker, on this occasion, the minister made an important announcement and gave us an update on the new senior community grant program that our government has launched. The program is a tremendous success, helping seniors across our province to stay connected and involved in their communities, especially the seniors in my riding of Newmarket Aurora. Mr. Speaker, would the minister please inform the House of how this grant continues to help improve the lives Question. of seniors in Ontario? Thank you. Minister I want to uh, thank the uh, member for Newmarket Aurora and congratulate him on his election to, uh, to this parliament. Um, speaker, I know that I will serve the people of Newmarket Aurora with zeal and dedication. Uh, let me say, Speaker, that the, our government introduced the uh, Seniors Community Grant Program 
uh, with the idea to keep our seniors engaged and active in their own environment, in their own community, to live a better and more meaning, meaningful life. Uh, speaker, the uh, grants fund uh, not-for-profit organization for groups that indeed encourage and promote a greater social inclusion, volunteers, and community engagement and to bring our seniors out of isolation. I'm very proud and very pleased, Speaker, to inform the House that so far 118 projects have been already uh, funded. Groups have received funds Answer. reaching out to some 25,000 seniors in our province. And, Speaker, we will continue to build on the success of this program. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I would like to thank the Minister for his response. It's great to hear how committed our government is to uh, our seniors, and I'm delighted to say that this grant has been very well received in my riding of Newmarket Aurora. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I recently had the pleasure of attending the celebration of the reopening of the Newmarket Seniors Place, an organization that boasts a membership of 1,000 seniors. It was a wonderful event with a number of activities, food, entertainment, and many, many seniors in attendance. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to say this celebration was made possible because of funding received from the Seniors, grant, uh, seniors Community Grant it, that helped the centre reopen its doors. Mr. Speaker, can the minister provide us with any additional details regarding this great initiative that's serving my senior constituents so well? Thank you, Minister. Again, Speaker, I want to thank the member from Newmarket, Aurora, and uh, I know that uh, uh, if the seniors in, in the uh, 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 a riding of the members are happy in having received the funds and doing this wonderful events. Uh, events like the one there and celebrations throughout Ontario are taking place as community groups are receiving the funding, Speaker. I have to say, Speaker, that I'm so proud. This is the first time that our seniors in Ontario, they are enjoying the benefit of the first ever in the province for our seniors grant. This is going directly to help our seniors stay connected, engaged in their own community and living a more meaningful life, Speaker. I have to say, because of the success of the program, Speaker, our funding increased from 500000 to $1 million in a thanks to Minister Sousa in the budget of the 2014. Answer. Speaker, I have to say that this is part of the Ontario Action Plan for Seniors. We will continue to work on it and continue to make Ontario the best, the best province where seniors can age and live gracefully. Thank you. Question, the member from Kitchener, Yes, uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of uh, Transportation. Minister, when I asked you in estimates this week about Last your government's time, commitment to deliver two-way, all-day go service to Kitchener Waterloo within five years, you told me, quote, there are a lot of commitments that governments make, that, that parties make, that are aspirational in nature. Yes, aspirational in nature. I believe commitments made before, during, or after an election are your word. They're your promise. And where we come from, we have a four-letter word for those who dress up their aspirations as commitments. Kitchener-Waterloo residents are still waiting for the four trains going in and out that were promised seven years ago. Now they have even more reason to be skeptical. Minister, question? A, very, a very simple question. When will Kitchener-Waterloo residents see two-way, all-day go service? Thank you. Minister of Transportation. I, uh, Speaker, I want to thank the member opposite for his question, and I, uh, I certainly had a, a, a terrific time at Estimates Committee having the opportunity uh, to, uh, to respond to questions from this member, not, about, uh, not just about issues relating to chrome yellow and school buses, for example, Speaker, but also to respond to questions uh, with respect to, to our very ambitious plan to deliver two-way, all-day, what we call regional express rail. Um, and what I find troubling, Speaker, more than anything else, is that this member repeatedly, both in his own community, a community that is so ably represented by our member from Kitchener Centre, uh, and at, uh, here today in the House and, and over the last few days at committee, seems to be far more interested in parsing my words and in getting to a game of semantics instead of actually working hard for his community to work with us to deliver two-way all-day go. Speaker, as I've said many times in this House, our government Answer. has a commitment and will deliver two-way all-day go service to Kitchener-Waterloo, to Milton, to Barrie, and along all of our corridors over the next decade. That's our plan. We'll get it done. Thank you, you see it, please? I would be remiss if I 
I uh, just just your timing is so impeccable. Just when I'm ready to admonish someone on this side, you give me that reason to do so. Um, I am going. I would be remiss if I did not tell the uh, deputy house leader that he's warned. And I will now turn to the member from Renfrew and say, "You're next." Carry on. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the minister. It does appear we've struck a chord here. In fact, minister and committee, those were your exact words. Your government's aspirations. At least the former Minister of Transportation was actually prepared to give a timeline, so why the change of heart? Minister, I am trying to work with you here. I'm giving you another opportunity to clean the, clear the air with the people of Kitchener-Waterloo. So, can you tell us today what timeline your ministry is now aspiring to for completion of all-day two-way GO service to Kitchener-Waterloo? Thank you. Minister. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member again for this question. Uh, it's interesting to me, both at committee in press releases that he's put out to his community and here again in the House today, Speaker, that this particular member seems very taken with the word aspirational. Let me talk about that for a quick second, Speaker. In the last election campaign, in that last Oxford, consultation that we had with the people of Ontario, that member, his leader, his party aspired to fire 100,000 Ontarians. This party, our leader, our government, aspired to move Ontario forward by building it up with an ambitious $29 billion plan for transit and transportation over the next 10 years. That's the work we're doing. We're going to deliver for Kitchener, for Milton, for Barrie, for Brampton, for Mississauga, for the entire province, because that's our plan, and we'll get the job done. Thank you. Thank you. Your question, the member from Hamilton East, Stony Creek. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Labour. Speaker, once again this afternoon, I will be bringing a, a bill forward called the Child Protect Performer Legislation Bill 17 to the Legislature for second reading. Speaker, this is an essential legislation to ensure that working children have the safest working environment possible in our province. My first bill, 71, was tabled on the 15th of May 2013, and unfortunately, Speaker, after going through committee with the government's support and assurances that the bill would go, it ended up as a political football on the order paper. Speaker, can this minister confirm to me that there will be no, I repeat, no political games before this current bill, which uh, protects children? Thank you. Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank, the, uh, I thank the Honourable Member for the question. If I was able to guarantee there would be no political games in this House, I'd be one unique politician. But let me tell you that, that I do support the bill personally. I know through uh, the ministry process, as, as we've investigated the bill over the years, that it's, it's a bill that's received support from the Ministry of Labour as well. I look forward to the debate this afternoon. I look forward to the passage of this bill through the process. At the end of the day, Speaker, you know and I know and the member knows, and we've had conversations on this, and he knows how personally supportive I am of this bill. At the end of the day, it's the will of this House that will pass this bill. It will be the three parties working together, the House leaders agreeing that this bill will move forward. I can honestly say, Speaker, that I wish the member well. He will have my personal support and, and the sir? support of the ministry as this process continues. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Minister, for your support. Uh, unfortunately, I hope the House leaders feel the same way. Speaker, Bill 17 encompasses the amendments that were made in committee just 11 and a half months ago. It has been through intensive writing, review, and committee processes. Ministry Strat worked with ACTRA, worked with Equity, Order. and me on the bill. And all the parties worked on it through the committee process and passed it. Speaker, the protection of child performers, the only legal child labour in Ontario, must be enshrined in law. Their safety should never be subject to negotiations by House leaders. Speaker, will this minister commit right now to his and his government full support, full support to protect child performers and by passing Bill 17 to third reading and to royal assent, not stalling it at, at House leaders' meetings? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member once again for the supplementary. I'm, I'm sure that all members understand in this House that the need to keep our kids safe, whether it's at school or in the workplace, is something that we all, to use a word used recently, aspire to. 
It's something that we want to see happen. There's a process that's employed in this House. The House leaders meet on a regular basis. They decide on the agenda of the House. Bills proceed in that way. So certainly, Speaker, I've met with the member opposite to express our support with the bill. Nothing would make me happier than to see this bill proceed. If it's the will of the third party, which I believe it is, certainly my colleagues on this side of the House that I've spoken to are in support of this bill. We want to see it move forward. We wish you well in this regard. There's a process that needs to be followed. Yes, Conservatives, I can't speak for. They can speak for themselves. I know where the rest of us stand, Speaker. Thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Ministers, there is approximately 1,549 pork producers in the province of Ontario, and they market roughly 4.8 million hogs, an industry contributing upwards of $5.6 billion to the Ontario economy. But, Minister, on January 22, 2014, the first case of PED was discovered in Ontario, a virus causing high death loss in pigs, especially nursing piglets. The disease which struck the United States in the spring of 2013 has killed millions of piglets south of the border and helped drive up the pork prices. It has spread through 30 U.S. states Question. and affected more than uh, 8,500 farms. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please update the House on what the government is doing to support Ontario's Thank swine you. producer during the challenging times. Thank you. Minister Agriculture, Food and uh, Rural Affairs. Well, thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the hardworking member from Northumberland, Quinty West, for that question this morning. The, the agri-food industry in the province of Ontario represents $34 billion of GDP. 760,000 individuals are employed in this industry, and the pork sector makes up $5.6 billion of the total GDP. Since PED was first discovered in the United States, the province and the industry have made concerted efforts to educate producers, transporters, and suppliers about the virus and help them implement strong biosecurity measures. In fact, through a red grant in the county of Lambton, Ontario, uh, we're providing funds now for a trucking firm, which is the first biosecurity firm, I believe, in North America. And that's a great tribute to the ingenuity of people yes, in sir. Lambton County. Wow. Our government. Our government has provided over $2 billion in immediate assistance to Ontario pork, follow the upbreak to support industry-wide enhancements to biosecurity through a Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, the member will sit. And he knows better. Supplementary. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for his answer. It is clear that the collaborative efforts by veterinarians farm groups, government, farmers, and many people in the swine sector to fight the disease in Ontario. Coupled with the province preparedness and resources put forward fighting this virus, have been instrumental in responding to and limiting the spread of PED in Ontario. But, but Minister, on July 21, 2014, the PED was found on an Ontario farm as part of the industry PED surveillance elimination project. Mr. Speaker, producers, industry, and public want to know why Ontario is continuing to see cases of PED. Can the minister please inform the House on why we continue to see cases of PED in Ontario? And now we're addressing the challenges as we heard Question. to the winter months. Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member for supplementary. The early identification of the source in Canada, along with summer weather, has helped reduce the impact of the virus in Ontario and has limited its spread. In fact, it's been over three months since the last case of the virus was confirmed, while Manitoba and some U.S. states continue to have new cases throughout the spring and summer months. Mr. Speaker, it's important to note that the PED is a virus which tends to flourish in cold weather. I recently had the opportunity to meet with officials from Mexico and the United States to discuss PED and shared information and heard from experts on how leaders can help prepare their region to manage the outbreak and defeat it. It remains critical for all the parts of the pork value chain, producers, transporters, suppliers, to be vigilant with biosecurity practices to prevent PED and other viruses from getting inside the swine production units in Ontario. Yes, sir. My ministry has been and will continue to work with the pork industry 
its strategies to mitigate the risk of PED's impact this fall or winter and ensuring Ontario's vital thank pork you. industry in this province. New question, the member from Central North. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question today is for the Minister of Education. And Minister, we all know that your Bill 10 is seriously flawed. And in spite of that, you still want to push it through this house quickly. The bill does absolutely nothing to provide a more safe daycare system. We calculate that a minimum of 140,000 independent daycare spaces will be lost and eliminated. You disagree with that number. So, Minister, it's very simple. How many independent daycare spaces have you cal calculated will be lost? Simple numbers, all I want to hear. Thank you. Minister of Education. Yes, thank you. Uh, actually, I'd love to hear how he calculated 140,000. But I can actually, I can actually. The uh, the member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke is warned. I'm very happy to tell uh, the member opposite, Speaker, that in fact we have, since we came into government, licensed 130,000 new spaces, and that's actual licensing data that we have licensed uh, those new licensed childcare spaces. But I really do have to challenge what the member opposite has said about Bill 10, because as we all know, the Ombudsman recently tabled a report, and he uh, made a number of recommendations. And I simply want to uh, quote what the Ombudsman told a Queen's Answer. briefing. He said, I am satisfied that the bill takes care of what needs to be legislated. I am satisfied with the current course of what's happening and Thank with you. the undertaking of the minister to Thank continue. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, the same people that wrote your briefing notes are the same people that let down the daycare system for the last 10 years. Okay? So, Minister, I want to tell you there are rallies being planned to protest the flawed Bill 10 and the loss of 140,000 independent daycare spaces. And we expect a rally will be held in your riding of Guelph in early November, and we'd like, you, we, we'd like to do it according to your schedule. These protests are, are being held because independent daycare operators have been completely left out of the consultation process that created this flawed, flawed bill. And in spite of the fact that they, independent daycare providers provide about 78 percent of the spaces in Ontario. But you know what? They don't belong to the Working Families Coalition. They don't have a big union to support them. So since you are denying, you are denying child care providers a voice by not allowing the bill to travel, as the MPP for Guelph, will you attend the Guelph Question. rally and hear the concerns of your constituents? Uh, thank you very much. I, we really do need to talk about the reality of how people have responded to the bill. So, for example, if you talk about the response of Andrea Culver, who's the coordinator for the Ontario Coalition for Better Child Care, yeah, she says, this is broad legislation that is going to really crack down on those unlicensed operators who have more than five children. But it also has the impact on child care centres and a very significant proposal for children from 6 to 12. Uh, I'd like to tell you, um, actually, Actually, uh, another quote from Andrea Culver. It's really a big step to moving from a patchwork of programs to a system of early learning and child care. We really feel this legislation is part of the move to create an early learning Thank and you. child care system. Thank you. A new question. A member from Hamilton Mountain. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. Parents expect this government to do its job and keep kids safe in daycare, but the Ombudsman has uncovered a shocking lack of inspectors to do the job. There are just 49 permanent child care advisors in Ontario, and the minister's new enforcement unit will only add six inspectors. It's no wonder illegal daycares operate with impunity, taking advantages of, uh, advantage of families without getting caught. There simply aren't enough inspectors to do the job. How can the minister possibly defend having just one inspector for every 22,000 kids in daycare? Thank you, Minister of Education. 
Yes, and I, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the findings that both the Ombudsman and our Ministry found was when we looked at the old way in which inspectors were organized is that they were resp responsible primarily for visiting and reviewing and issu issuing and renewing licenses, and then coincidentally had uh, additional responsibility to uh, respond to complaints about unlicensed care. What we've done is created a new unit whose only responsibility is to respond to complaints about unlicensed child care, That's and great. that move to create a totally dedicated enforcement unit that will only worry about complaints on unlicensed child care yes, has been endorsed yes. by the Ombudsman. In fact, his recommendations include moving ahead with setting that up, and I'm very pleased to report Thank you. that that unit has been set Thank up. You. Supplementary. Speaker, I must have read a different report because the quote that I read from the Ombudsman said, too little, too late. Yes. Inspectors say they're drowning under their workload and unable to keep up. That means that kids will continue to fall through the cracks. And according to the Ombudsman himself, the minister's new enforcement unit will just have six investigators able to lay charges against illegal operators. It's nothing but a drop in the bucket because there's no way that one inspector can keep 22,000 kids safe in day, day in and day out. In contrast, the private day home agencies are required to employ one inspector for every 25 homes, which equals to 125 kids. Why does the minister have such low standards for her own department? Thank you, minister. Yes, I, I'm, I'm afraid that the member didn't actually understand the previous response, but let's just move on to what the Ombudsman said. The Ombudsman said, the Ombudsman said in his report, the government and the ministry have taken positive steps and made concrete plans to improve the process for dealing with complaints about unlicensed daycare. In the past year, the ministry has made genuine and focused efforts to rise to the challenge of ensuring that Ontario has a proactive, timely, risk-based and effective system for monitoring unlicensed child care operations. And I would like to repeat that all the people in this unit will do nothing but respond to complaints and make sure yes, that sir. any directives they issue have been completed. And when we get Bill 10, they will actually have the ability to impose fines. They will actually have the ability to close down Thank daycares, you. which are unsafe. The question, the member from Ottawa, Orleans. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have a question for the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. A day when ghosts and gulls come out across the province looking for treats and, and hoping to avoid being tricked. It's a wonderful time when communities like mine come together with decoration costume and get to meet their neighbours in the spookiest of settings. I know children in Ottawa Orleans are particularly excited to show off their costume and go trick-or-treating door-to-door. While we all enjoy our time with family and friends during Halloween and dress up as many of our favorite <laughs> monsters and villains, it's important to remember the different ways we can be green while celebrating Halloween. Speaker, through you, to the, could the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change please update the House on what Question. the government is doing to help Ontarians enjoy a more environmentally friendly Halloween? Thank you. Sure, the environment and Thank you. Uh, I, I want to. Uh, Thank my dear friend uh, from Ottawa, Orleans, for that great question. Uh, and I also would like to wish uh, everyone in the house a uh, very safe and spooky Halloween if you're out with your little ones. If you haven't gone door to door enough this year, uh, here's, at least you get candies and a smile this time. Um, I, I also. <laughs> I also, uh, I also just want to recognize uh, this program, Mr. Speaker, is really the remarkable creative work of the very great people who work in the Ministry of Environment, who I'm very proud uh, to be here on the floor on their behalf. And they have come up this year with a campaign highlighting, high, highlighting a number of Enviroween monsters, Mr. <laughs> Speaker, to remind us ghosts and ghouls about some of the small actions all of us can take to help protect the environment. I've got some favorites, Mr. Speaker, and if you've been to the 
social media website, you'll see these, these folks. And Dr. Sir? Frankenfield's monster reminds us of the importance of reducing, reusing and recycling to make sure we keep as much waste out of our landfills as possible. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, I'm sorry. All right. Got to go. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, my question is for the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Minister, I'm terrifically, terrifically thrilled to hear that once again the Ministry of the Environment and Climate Change is finding fun ways to encourage Ontarians to enjoy their Halloween in an environmentally friendly way. I'm sure constituents of my riding of Ottawa Orleans will be happy to know they can have a frightfully good time at Halloween while doing their part to fight environmental evil like Dr. Frankenfile monsters and something else, Bottlezilla. I especially appreciate the minister's mention of Ontario drinking water. It's important that we protect one of our most precious resources now and for the future generation Question. of bulls and goblins. Speaker, through you to the minister, can you inform this house of any witches and warlock the people of Ontario should Thank be on you. the lookout to help protect our water? Minister. Well, maybe I can go through some of the other characters. Well, there's Exhaust, Mr. Speaker, who encourages people to walk, cycle, carpool, or take public transit to reduce uh, emissions from vehicles. My, my personal favorite, Bottlezilla, uh, is a monster I have some personal experience with encouraging people to fill up at the tap and bring a reusable bottle with them to reduce waste and take advantage of Ontario's world class and great drinking water. Um, there are. Uh, they're also all. I, I, it would be great if members of the legislature. These are nonpartisan. We have blue characters, red characters, and orange characters, and green characters. So you can find your favorite. Uh, but it's a great social media to, to get kids uh, more aware about the simple things. Uh, my, my other favorite, Mr. Speaker, is the pill later, which teaches us not to flush our pharmaceuticals uh, down the toilet. So there's some very good lessons here. I hope you'll take advantage of these very nonpartisan tools. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the acting premier. In question period on July the 8th, the premier acknowledged the need to construct the Highway 6 Morriston bypass. She said, and I quote from Hansard, there are investments needed. I would call attention to a statement that the member for Wellington Halton Hills made yesterday. End quote. That statement of mine, the one she was talking about, had highlighted the need for the Morriston bypass. If the premier, who is herself a former minister of transportation, thinks that the Highway 6 Morriston bypass is needed, why is it not yet on the ministry's five-year plan for new highway construction? Thank you, Deputy Premier. Minister of Transportation. Minister of Transportation. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to begin by thanking uh, the member opposite for the question today and also for raising it uh, on a number of occasions uh, since June the 24th, uh, since I was first sworn in as Minister of Transportation, and for also raising uh, this issue, uh, this issue at the estimates committee yesterday. So, just to be clear, our government does understand the need to move forward with the realignment of Highway 6 between Freelton and Guelph, which will, of course, bypass the community of Morriston and provide improved connection to Highway 401 and the Hanlon Expressway. And we continue to move the project along uh, with respect to the design and environmental phases to eventually prepare. Uh, for construction. But what I also said at estimates yesterday, I think Speaker Baer is repeating here in this House, this is one of the reasons uh, that I'm encouraged to hear these kinds of questions from members uh, on, others, on the other side of the House, because it's a clear recognition from them that it's very important for our government to make the kind of crucial investments in public infrastructure like highways, like bypasses, like transit. And I look forward to uh, seeing ongoing support from these members for our very ambitious $29 billion plan for public infrastructure. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, that's all well and good, but I think I need to point out that on October the 6th, representatives of the Morriston Bypass Coalition were here at Queen's Park. The coalition includes the City of Guelph, the City of Hamilton, their Chambers of Commerce, businesses like Tim Hortons, Maple Leaf Foods, Nestle Waters, Canada Bread and Cargill, as well as the County of Wellington and the Township of Puslinch. The Minister knows that I've been calling for the construction of the Morriston Bypass for many, many years, predating his appointment as minister. And when will he finally put it on the five-year plan? Thank you. Minister of Transportation. Well, as I, thank you very much, Speaker, and I thank the member for the follow-up. As I said at committee yesterday, uh, the Ministry of Transportation is in the process right now of finalizing the next rollout for the five-year plan that he referenced in the question. I do look forward to continuing to work with him and members from uh, his community and members from communities right across the province of Ontario as we do move forward with our plan to build Ontario up. Again, this is why it is so crucial 
for us to have comprehensive and full support in this legislature for the $29 billion that we'll be investing, $14 billion of which will be for crucial infrastructure outside the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area, and up to $15 billion, Speaker, for public transit projects in the GTHA. Yes, it's why it's so important for us to see in communities like that members and in all other communities that we all represent as 107 members of this legislature, we need to invest. You can't slash and you. your way to growth. This is the way to build up Ontario and Thank move you. the province forward. Thanks, Frank. New question. The member from uh, um, Ottawa. Oshawa. Uh, <laughs> the member from Oshawa. Yeah. yeah far distant land of Oshawa. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Associate Minister of Finance. Speaker, the government stated in this year's budget that individuals participating in a comparable workplace pension plan would not be required to enroll in the Ontario Retirement Pension Plan. In that same document, the Liberal government committed to introducing PRPP legislation in the fall of 2014, nearly three years before the plan ORPP would even see the light of day. The Liberal government claims their priority is to create a public pension plan for the workers of this province, yet they are leading with a private option that will send Ontarians hard-earned contributions to Bay Street. Speaker, will the government's bank-friendly PRPP be considered comparable and qualify for an exemption from the Ontario Retirement Pension Plan? Is this why the Liberal government is giving PRPPs a three-year head start Thank over you. the ORPP? Thank you. Associate Minister of Finance, responsible for the Ontario Pension Plan. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the member for, from Oshawa for her question and uh, for her, her work as the critic on pensions. Uh, speaker, the fact of the matter is that we have a retirement savings challenge. People are simply not saving enough for their retirement, and this is of concern for the future, for our economic future. And what we've committed to do in our budget is to introduce the Ontario Retirement Pension Plan. That is our, that is our commitment, and that is what we intend to do which is to ensure that we have a secure retirement future for Ontarians. At the same time, we know that people will continue to have their goals in retirement. We have to ensure that there is a strong retirement system Answer. here in Ontario, including voluntary measures such as the PRPP. Thank you, Speaker. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member from Simcoe North has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Minister of Education concerning Bill 10. This matter will be debated next Tuesday at 6 p.m. We have a deferred vote on the motion for second reading of Bill 15, an act to amend various statutes in interest of reducing insurance fraud, enhancing tow and storage services, and providing for other matters regarding vehicles and highways. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bell. <coughs>
the members take their seats, please? On October 21, 2014, Mr. Badley moves second reading of Bill 15. All those in favour, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Nackby. Mr. Nackby. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Madam Mayor. Madam Mayor. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Cadre. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Rosetti. Mr. Rosetti. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Balkasin. Mr. Balkasin. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Mangat. Mrs. Mangat. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassic. Ms. Jassic. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Domerla. Ms. Domerla. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Ms. Nadu Harris. Ms. Nadu Harris. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Neal. Mr. Neal. <laughs> Mr. Arnott. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Huda. Mr. Huda. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaughton. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Please rise one at a time to be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Mr. Vantop. Mr. Vantop. Mr. Denova. Mr. Denova. Mr. Tabins. Mr. Tabins. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Manta. Mr. Manta. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Mr. Chimino. Mr. Chimino. Ms. French. Ms. French. The ayes are 66, the nays are 14. The ayes being 66 and the nays being 14, I declare the motion carried. Pursuant to the uh, order of the House dated October the 29th, this bill is ordered, referred to the Standing Committee on General Government. The member from Kitchener-Waterloo on a point of order. Mr. Uh, Speaker, I'd like to correct my record from this morning. I used the wrong Judy. Judy Finley was the former child advocate. Thank you very much. Okay. The uh, member is correct in terms of all members have the opportunity to correct their record, and that was in order. Um, there, are no deferred, there are no further deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.